You're listening to the Arisha Wisdom Podcast, episode 85. Welcome to the Arisha Wisdom Podcast, where growth and spirituality create an enhanced life's journey with the wisdom of Ifa and Arisha in our everyday lives. I am your host, Omileti Olubumi. Welcome to the Arisha Wisdom Podcast. I am Omileti Olubumi. Thank you for spending some of your time with me to talk about all things Orisha, spirituality, and growth. So turn up the volume in your car. This is going to be a fun workout episode. If you want to clean the house and you want to have it sparkling clean, this will be the episode you hear just because it should be a lot of fun to hear. Put on your earbuds or listen with some friends. Grab coffee, tea, something healthy to drink, and let's chat. This episode is special. It is very special because it is a, an idea that came up while I was swimming. And the idea was, shoot, if I was to do this all over again, what would I do different? What would I change? What would happen? How would I start over? Like, what would I do? And the idea started kind of bubbling up. And I decided I am going to ask around this question. And I have brought someone into the podcast today, which I'm so excited about because this person and I are like peas in a pod. And he has been in the traditions for a lot longer than I have. And I am so excited. But before we get into that, let's take a listen to the sponsor of today's episode. And with that, let's go. This episode is being brought to you by our newest resource available, the Alejo's Guide to Godparents. Inside of Alejo's 101, there is a great new framework to a challenge that is one of the first ones that any and every new person will encounter. And that is the how to get a godparent. For you, I have created the Alejo's Guide to Godparents. This is a brand new and it's created because of the many questions that this topic gets. What is it? It is a guide with video and audio which will basically give you the map and the keys for the vehicle of how to get a godparent. Why do you need this? Because no matter what you want to do in these traditions, you will need someone to help you, to guide you, to uplift you, and to basically guide you on your spiritual journey. Because if you don't get the right person for you, you will continue to be where you are, alone, without guidance, and without help. But how do you get this? Go to orishawisdom.com forward slash omileti, that's O-M-I-L-E-T-I, and click on the image that says, finally, your guide to choosing the right godparent. Watch the quick video and get it because it's an amazing opportunity that has come from your questions, from your experiences, and from my desire to see more new folks finding where they belong with the Alejos Guide to Godparents. I hope that you're able to go and take a look at today's episode's sponsor. Now, let's get back to our episode. Today, we have a guest that I recently was told we know each other as of today for 22 years. This person is extremely resilient. This person is not only like brain smart, not only intelligent in use of words, but grasps the tradition almost as a guppy would take to water. It's just like this is his home. And I am very, very blessed and lucky to know him. And this is a person that no matter where I probably will live in the world, Whenever we touch base, it's like time never stopped. 
we just keep going and we keep growing within our spiritual traditions. This person, his name is Pedro and we will introduce him to you as Pedro Omo Oya. So just based by that, you will know that this is an initiate priest, initiated Orisha priest, an Olorisha of Orisha Oya. And with that, I would love to introduce him to you. So Pedro Omo Oya, welcome to the Orisha Wisdom Podcast. Welcome. Thank you very much for introducing me. Applause, applause, applause to you for this groundbreaking, innovative um, platform that you have created. I remember, wow, over five years ago, you came up with this idea, you know, if I could help other people do things better, what would I do? And it just snowballed and catapulted into what it is today. And Many thanks to you for creating a platform like this where people like us who back in the day when we didn't have anyone to help us, you know, when we needed that guidance, you know, you're making it easier for those today to kind of sort of be able to be on the fast track, you know, uh, to be able to do things smarter um, instead of having to work harder or go through some of the pitfalls that we did. Um, or any of the challenges that people may sometimes face in today's society. Um, but with that being said, thank you very much. Um, pretty soon this fall, I'm sorry, this summer in July, excuse me, I will be turning 15 as an initiate of Oya, and it has been a very long journey. Um, Wait, don't I, go there uh, just yet. Don't go there just yet. Don't go there just yet. First of all, I want to backtrack a bit. When you started saying that, I had all the little hairs stand up because I had forgotten about those conversations that I spoke to you when I didn't even know what I was going to do. And after that is when the Orisha Wisdom community and all that stuff happened. That's insane. I remember. That's right. You just brought me like back on how this wasn't even a thing yet. It was an idea. It was an idea. Yeah, I re oh dang it's oh my god that's awesome but enough about that honestly I'm just glad and I'm still glad that you have always lent an ear because I remember asking you a lot of questions in between especially in the beginning I remember the question was you know what would you change or what would you like to I remember ah, ah the question was what would you like to have known before you initiated and you were like, oh, I wish I would have known this, this and that. I remember that conversation. Now, right. before we get into the nitty gritty of today, tell us now a little bit about you within our spiritual realm. Who are you? What's your lineage? And now we can get into the 15 years and all that stuff. And the okay. floor is yours. My name is Pedro Perez. Um, it's a very typical Latino name. I am uh, of uh, Puerto Rican descent. Both my parents uh, were born on the island. I was born here in the United States. I will be 49 in June. And um, my path in the traditions was kind of weird because um, I am currently and have always been since I got initiated uh, from the lineage of pimienta y coral, which means uh, pepper and coral. And those were two lineages that got merged in Cuba. Uh, if I remember the story correctly, one person had only X number of people to help with the ceremony. Another person had a number of X people to help with the ceremony. And it was like, you know what? We got to make do with what we got. Let's just do this together. And they did it together. And from there was born, out of two different lineages, a new one mm -hmm. because they did what they did to get the ceremony yeah. over and done. What is it? The show The show must go on. We got to get this going. It has to be done somehow. Correct. Yeah. Correct. And, you know, uh, 200 years later, you know, from New York, my uh, several people, several of my elders, you know, initiated other people who then initiated my godfather, who then initiated myself. Um, uh, what can I say? I've always felt I was different. Well, I and, remember, wait, before you get there, I think we've, mm -hmm. we, we, I don't want to touch on it too much, but I know that 
you had your foot, you actually, not even your foot, you were big into Espiritismo before crossing over to the Orisha side. And so Correct. you had a lot of, like a lot of your spirituality thing going even before you, you went to the foot of Orisha. Correct. Correct. Um, you want to tell us a bit about that? Yeah, that, that's what I was actually going to lead into. From the, from the time that I was a child, I actually felt slightly different. Mm -hmm. And I, I knew that there were things in this realm or spiritual plane that were just different to me. Mm -hmm. And years later, come to find out, um, my grandmother, you know, she dabbled and dabbled uh, heavily in spiritualism. My great aunt had a spiritual work center in Puerto Rico where she used to consult people at all hours of the day and night <laughs> when when her husband, my uncle, finally left the Merchant Marines and they went to New York, um, she decided to start working in real estate. And she did that for several years, but she missed the spiritual framework. She missed helping clients and doing readings and all that other stuff. Mm -hmm. And she met someone who encouraged her to open up a botanical shop which she did, and that's where she met her godparents who walked in one day, and lo and behold, she had Shango Crown for like 40 years. Mm -hmm. uh, so all this is going on as I'm like growing up and not really realizing this. And then I met someone in, uh, in college, my, my now deceased ex-wife, um, her and her mother and her grandmother and her great-grandmother and her great-aunt were all spiritualists. Mm -hmm. It was a the family lineage, a family tradition, they all had psychic abilities and they were able to channel um, spirits and, and spirit guides and things of that nature. And when I went to their house one day, I just noticed, you know, a couple of statues, this, that, the third. I'm like, oh, yeah, I've seen this. Mm -hmm. Grab my hat. Grab my hat. just like that. Mm -hmm. What is it? And that's what led me to first get beads in 1992. And. By 1997, I received um, my warriors, which is uh, your mm -hmm. your two basic your two basic initiations. Yeah. One, you know, your first initiation is obviously, you know, you get protective beads that are under the tutelage of a godparent, and then you get your warriors, which set you into the path of Orisha, and that began my work. Or excuse me, it set the groundwork for everything else. Um, once I got married, my ex-wife and I, we used to consult people. There were times that, you know, she might not be in that frame of mind because of work, stress, or whatever. And sometimes I would have to take on some of her clients. Sometimes she would have to take on some of my clients. Mm -hmm. and, and what kind of readings were these? There were spiritual readings, right? There was there yeah. were spiritual readings. Um, Sometimes with tarot cards, sometimes with um, another type of um, uh, Spanish playing cards, which we call briscas. I don't know what they're called in English, uh, but they're the ones the that one have with the copa the, and the one with the la lampara. Okay, okay, yeah, yeah. Those are the Spanish playing cards. Um, and to be totally honest, there were times that I would literally say stuff to people. And it wasn't really me talking because personally speaking, when I have gotten my tarot cards read, I don't believe a single thing that they're telling me. <laughs> but conversely, when I am in that frame of mind and I am doing the reading, it's literally not me saying things because I'm looking at the pictures like, what the heck is this? And But the words that come out of my mouth are like nine times out of 10, totally on point. I've had people come back to me two days later and say, oh my God, that person you told me that was going to tell me that they were pregnant and try to bamboozle me. You were so right. Like, how did you know that? Hey, how did you know that? I hey, didn't know that person. The guides maybe, right? Right. The guides were literally feeding me information mm -hmm. that I'm saying to this person, be careful with this chick because she's going to try to make you be the baby daddy. And he came back three days later, like, oh, my God, what do I do? <laughs> like, you were so right. How did you know this was going to happen? I didn't know. 
I mean, you know. I remember. Uh, I, I, wait, wait, wait. Don't, don't go just yet. Don't go just yet. Don't go just yet. I know that it wasn't just about um, spiritual readings. And one thing that absolutely excited me about you. No, no, it wasn't your just good looks. <laughs> it was your love for herbs. And you had this knack. I think you still have it. I think you still have it. It's just that I know that when you initiate, sometimes you kind of have to temper a few things off to give way to the Orisha traditions. But I remember one time, actually many times, we would talk and you're like, oh my God, I woke up again and this Egun took over and now I have a whole bunch of little botellitas with little baths and I don't know what's what because nothing's labeled. And I would be dying laughing with that. That is a memory of you that I hope to always take with me. I could just see you. I could I could picture you. I, did, I had never been to your house at that point, but I went to your mom's house. So I could picture you in that kitchen waking up like, oh, my God, that was a good sleep. What the heck just happened here? There's just botellitas all over the place. And what the heck is all this mess? And there's plantitas all over the place. And so you <laughs> you remember that? I know. I've, I've always had a thing for plants. Yeah. Uh, my mother never had a green thumb, and my grandmother could grow everything but a pencil. That's so hysterical. And, I mean, I've been to Puerto Rico a bajillion times um, uh -huh. since from, from the womb. Two places I don't get lost in are the Bronx and Puerto Rico. Hysterical. Um, very hysterical. My mother had it in for my father during her pregnancy. She needed to get away from him, like, every weekend. That's hysterical. Uh, while she was pregnant with me. So she would go visit her sisters in the Bronx. You throw me in, at 149 in Grand Concourse. You throw me in Hunts Point. Uh, you throw me on Southern Boulevard. I'm home. I know where to go. It's hysterical. I know how to get back home. You throw me in Manhattan. I don't know. You throw me in Brooklyn. Maybe if I find 287, I might make it back to <laughs> over the... Don't worry. If it's in Manhattan, I got you. <laughs> Maybe I might be able to find the Outer Bridge Crossing. You throw me in Puerto Rico before GPS. I've actually no. been from one part of the island to the other to visit relatives I hadn't seen in like 20 years. Oh. A whole new highway, a whole new expressway had been constructed. And I got there door to door in like 1994 without a GPS. Um, yeah, you're crazy. Now, plants. Okay. Still crazy. But, I wouldn't but, but do going that back, in Puerto Rico. But going back to Puerto Rico, um, every year, every summer, even when I was in college, every um, winter break or summer break, I would go visit my grandmother for those six, seven weeks that I'd have off. Mm -hmm. And she taught me the love of plants. My mm -hmm. grandmother had mm -hmm. everything and under the sun in her backyard. My, my grandmother would literally grow aloe vera plants with spikes four and five feet big. Wow. In between rocks. And then having, because they have a lot of babies and a lot of offshoots. And and they would literally be sprouting out from a rock. I'm like, Grandma, how'd you do that? Oh, I just stuck it in there with some sand and some dirt and it just took off. It's hysterical. So like, I didn't okay. know this bit about you. So in all the years, this part I didn't know about you. So your love so for plants was, I mean. I thought from my grandmother. Yeah. Like, my mother would try to grow plants here and there, but they never really. Now she's getting like my grandmother. Like, I recently went to her house um, a couple of months ago, and I actually looked, and she had an aloe vera plant that was, like, two feet high in the middle of the kitchen table. I'm like, Mom, okay, like, you really got to do something. Like, you need help. That's good. No, no, no. Like, what That's good. We need to encourage that so that then she can yeah. give you some. <laughs> So now, now she's finally developing that knack. Gotcha. Um, but anyway, my grandmother was the one who taught me, you use this herb for this, you use this plant ah. for that. This is toxic to the body. This makes a soothing tea. This is good for, um, I don't know what it's called in English. In Spanish, it's called tartago. It looks similar to a maple leaf. Mm. The leaf has five, um, five fingers or five peaks, so to speak. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's a toxic herb if you in, uh, con um, consume it. 
However, it's great for warding off a negativity and evil eye and things like that. So in Puerto Rico, because the houses are made out of cement most of the time, she'd literally grab a bunch of herbs, this, that, the third, put it in a bucket. She'd rip some things apart, throw in some, you know, Florida water, throw in some holy water, throw in some of this, throw in some of that. And Mm -hmm. she'd literally go, go around the house with like, a piece of the stick from the tree mm-hmm. and she beat the walls. Yeah. I, I think that's a very common thing um, in Latino households. I don't care what country or what spiritual tradition you're from. There's usually just, some form of beating up the house with the plants, especially for a cleaning. Not just Latinos. I was once um, stuck on stupid watching almost every episode of the Long Island media. And she one time said something that made sense. Whether you believe her or not, or whether you're a fan or not, she did make something that, she did say something that made sense. And that was when things happen in a house, it leaves an indelible fingerprint. I believe that. And that's why you need the sage, incense, and basically smoke things out because you need to remove the pain from the walls. Interesting. Or something to that mm-hmm. effect is what she said. Because I think a crime had happened in a house and she was trying to get to the bottom of the mystery uh, and no one knew. You know, it just felt like there had been a lot of pain in the house. And I think, like, let's say a family had been murdered or someone died who was sick or whatever. The house was sick from the person's pain. I got it. And that makes so, sense. And that makes sense. And, and I think that does. that's where the misas also come in. And that's why we do um, incenses yeah. before and all of that stuff and, and the water and the cleaning. I get it. That makes sense. You know, so I learned all of that from my grandmother. Mm-hmm. And 95% of her children and most of my relatives were baptized Catholic. Mm-hmm. They grew up with a mother who was my spiritualist and then they all became God-fearing Christian. So they all went from one extreme to another. Mm-hmm. Um, and with me, it was just like, oh my God, this is cool. This reminds me of something, but I couldn't figure out what. Mm-hmm. So one day I had a conversation with my mother and I said, mom, did you ever do ABC one, two, three, like grandma when I was itty bitty, like first, second grade? Mm-hmm. And she says, yeah, I used to do it all the time. I said, okay. That's why it seems familiar to me. That's why it seems like home. Oh, my God. I was just thinking the exact same thing. I was like, oh, it seems like home to him. And then now think about it. So then you get married to something that absolutely fit into what we, what was your feeling of home. Correct. So it's like you're fitting yourself into your perfect shoe. Correct. Ah. Uh-huh. Well, by the way, while you were talking, I did a quick search. So the tartaco plant is also known as caper spurge, by the way. And it's called, like the the scientific name is Ricinus communis, R-I-C-I-N-U-S communis. But you can also get tartagus. You can also find it that way. And it is also poisonous to livestock. It affects the bone marrow. So people don't be drinking it. Here you go. Oh, oh wow. I never knew that part. Yeah, just literally as you were telling me, I'm like, hmm. Because I know about tartago, but I didn't know that. So, well, okay. there's, another plant, there's another plant that's very similar to essence we're on the topic of plants. And this is how I learned that one was toxic and one wasn't. There's a very similar plant that has a similar shape. The leaves have a similar shape, but the stalk of the tree has like little hairs and those little hairs trap moisture and the, the tree, they call it Tautua or Tuatua in Puerto Rico. I don't know the botanical name. But anyway, my uncle had a, um, an upset stomach and Tautua is what my grandmother would use because the leaf is kind of resinous. It has um, like a resin on it. It's it's not necessarily waxy, but when you break off a leaf, it starts to tear. And those drops are what you put in a homemade tea to 
alleviate the stomach. Guess what it's and called? I, it's I'm sorry? commonly known as bellyache bush. <laughs> Is that hysteria? I'm literally learning this up. So tua tua, it's called jatropha gossipifolia. That's what it's called. But it's commonly known as the bellyache bush. Look at that. And I never knew that. Yeah. Um, and I literally went and grabbed four or five leaves of tartago. <gasps> oh. And my grandmother looked at me she's like, oh, my God, what are you trying to say? You trying to kill us? That's she's like, that's poisonous. And well, I'm like, but, guess, I'm glad que tu no mataste a tu, hijo, a tu tío. <laughs> that's it. I'm glad you didn't do your uncle in. <laughs> You know, so it was, it, it was, it was just interesting. And I would just go around the back, backyard. Grandma, what's this? I never knew that basil came in like a red color. Um, and my grandmother used to call it Jerba Moran, which is like a, uh, Moran means like purple. purple. Yeah. I never knew that there was like a purple bush basil or something like that. I think that's what it's called. Purple bush basil. Um, and, you know, she just taught me so many different things. And that just made my, that just stimulated my mind to want to learn more. Like I knew my life had a bigger purpose than just mm. learning about plants. You know, I knew how to make a couple of homemade remedies. I knew how to do this. I knew how to do that. And it just helped me expand to, to know and do more. Um, and some people are fine just leading a um, a traditional homeopathic plant based spiritual based religion. I knew that there was more, mm. and I wanted to know more, and that's what led me to continue wanting to learn more about these traditions, because I knew that it didn't just stop with um, simple spiritualism. I knew that it didn't stop with um, plants and herbs, and I started buying books. Don't we all start buying books? Buy books, right? Oh, we all. I do want to say something. If that is your path to lead, you know, just to clean your home and just, you know, to do a, a white bath every now and then or, you know, to put incense every now and then, there's nothing wrong with that. Nothing totally at all. Nothing, because if that is what you're meant to do, and then you push to be, you know, um, the medium of wherever you live and the spiritualist of wherever you live, you're going against what you're supposed to do. But you, early on, so I wanted to go back before we get into the next section. You said something. You said when you were little, you knew you were different. And I know we're going way back because the conversation got really good and I didn't want to interrupt that. But what, so, what does so that going mean back, that you it, knew you were different? I mean, you're already in a very spiritual kind of home. What, what does that mean? Well, see, it meant when I had that conversation with my mother about my, my grandmother doing certain things, and she was telling me that she used to do the same thing. Mm -hmm. I asked her if she remembered, if she remembered anything odd about me doing something similar. What did she and say? She, she told me a funny story when I was about three years old or four years old. I don't know what happened that I went to the bedroom. I grabbed one of her blue or red handkerchiefs. Tied it around my head. I grabbed the bucket. I grabbed the mop. And I grabbed some Florida water. I grabbed a couple of things, put them in a bucket. And I started cleaning the house in a spiritual way. Apparently, I must have seen my mother do something. And I guess I must have felt that the energy was off or something was wrong at home. And I went and I did the same How thing. How old were you around? I may have been about three or four. That is, you know, that's like to us, that's like the cutest thing ever when the little ones, they start like mimicking, but they, but they put two and two together and why they're doing that thing. Okay. Right. Um, and she also remembers that I think my 
father who didn't appreciate that kind of stuff. I think she said my father spanked me for mm. doing that. Um, and I guess it just got, it was like a buried memory. Interesting. So you, okay. I, I find, and, and it's funny because for my kids, at least the two little ones, um, although my oldest one is now 23, when I really dove into the traditions like really, really deeply, he was about three or four. And Right, I remember. He, of, cor- of course you remember because we met when he was like in diapers. And um, for him, this was normal as well as my kids. So interesting that you knew that you were different but if my kids were to tell you that is perfectly normal normal day to day that's normal if somebody dresses in white it's like oh i guess they're doing something oh yeah we got to do incense okay whatever like it's so normal right but for you so what you mentioned was so you grew up with this your grandmother was into this your mom was into this but then your mom moved and she stopped but my correct mom. my mother yeah my mother had, my mother had a, an experience uh, totally unrelated but mm-hmm. it was a, a life changing experience for her she was coming back from a funeral in Puerto Rico and they must have circled the New York Bay like ten times the plane ran into some turbulence and some really really rough weather mm-hmm. they really thought they were going to lo- lose their lives yeah that's scary and a- and after that my mother just you know. Like she stopped smoking, she stopped drinking, she started going to church more often, and she just became grounded in her faith. In her way. I've al- in her way. Yeah. I've always had conflictive feelings regarding mainstream religion. Okay. Only because for me it felt forced upon. I know. I understand where, what you're where, saying. Whereas everything else felt like home and felt like peace and felt like me. Got it. Yeah. And that's, that's a feeling that you can't fight. And that I think comes from very young. So, um, for myself being a seven day Adventist very early on, I knew that this was not quite where I wanted to be. And I was itching to get out. And so I get it. I get the feeling. So for you, the spirituality of your, your, your roots, basically, was home. Oh. Okay. So now that we've kind of looked at baby Pedro, little Pedro, <laughs> young Pedro, <laughs> and older Pedro, because we looked at you married, spirituality has been a thing right all along, which all leads me to the big question that this podcast is about. And that's why we spent a little bit of time getting to know you. Because now, tell us, if you were to start all over again, if you were to do Orisha all over again, let's say you're stripped out of everything right now, meaning in the Orisha traditions, Mm -hmm. what would you do differently or keep the same and we can talk about these things because i know that you kept the spirituality because i know we're going to dive into this now so if you were to do it all over again if you were to start over again what would you do differently i would have asked i would have asked for number one i would have asked more questions at an earlier age Mm. for the simple reason that my great aunt had um orisha made for many years and it was kept secret. It was kept hidden. I remember going to my great aunt's house when we would go to Puerto Rico for vacation. And that was always like the one side trip we had to take. That was the side trip we took either before we got to grandma's house or after we left grandma's house because they didn't want anyone to see us coming or going to my great aunt's house because, you know, she's a santera. You know, she's got changome. She's got all this the secret stuff in a secret room that's padlocked. No one's allowed to go in it. Heck yeah. Et cetera, et cetera. You know, and, you know, here she is, this 70-year-old woman walking around in a house coat smoking a cigar. With a pañuelo on her head, I'm sure. 
with a with a red handkerchief on her Heck head. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> and que viva cachango playing in the background. <laughs> Let me tell you, she had statues all over the house, but it wasn't up until I was older that I was able to appreciate some of, of the statues. No, of not course, to, because you're young not, and not, you don't know what the value of them are. Well, well not the typical Catholic-looking statues. She had statues carved out of wood. Nice. Like she had a... Do you remember those old... Gold filigree family photos that were like maybe 28 by 36. They took a whole wall. They were heavy. They were gilded in gold. They had a glass frame on them. Yeah, I remember and, those. And that household, now would look brownish. Right. And in some houses, the, pe typical Spanish people would either have like um, mm -hmm. either, either a family photo or a Catholic photo, like the Sacred Heart of Jesus. Um, the Virgin Mary, or you'd see like Jesus on the cross, yeah, you know, you know, depicting the crucifixion. She had something like that carved out of wood hanging on her. That's insane. And that's awesome. And the detail and the clarity in the, in the staining was just artwork that you don't see anymore. I mean, you know, you can, you can imitate, but you can't, you know, duplicate. Gotcha. Um, so, all right. And, you so would have I would, asked I would, her a I would, lot more questions. I would have asked a lot more questions. Like, how come I can't go in that room? Okay. Why? I want to see. I would have. I would have sat down and had more meaningful conversations with her, because I didn't have conversations with her until I was like nineteen, until I was twenty, until and by then, you know, I had already seen a um, spiritualist in the Bronx. Mm -hmm. You know, but then I made it my business to go out of my way to visit my great aunt to spend that time with her, to see her work with. Why? You know, it's funny because out of all the things that I would have said knowing you for over two decades, I wouldn't have said that. I would have said like a million other things, but this actually is much more the perfect response because then if you would have had these answers earlier on, then I think a lot of the later in life actions wouldn't have been done at all. Correct. Yeah. That way I would have had access to Arisha sooner. Yeah. 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 You know, I, I actually know someone who is way older than me um, in, in the Arisha traditions. She has Oya uh, crowned as well. And I remember her being pregnant. I remember being to a drumming and oh yeah, I was trying to manifest it with her being pregnant. They had to take her out of the room because you know, even though we know and we we feel in our hearts that Arisha does not come to do anyone any harm, you never know what what may affect of someone who's pregnant, you know. Um, and um, several months later, down the line, when she gave birth to her son, her son got crowned at the age of nine months. I can't believe it. And you, you know, know, if and that would have happened, that would have been an interesting thing because they would have said that child is mine. <laughs> you know, and it's just it's just such a beautiful thing to have access to the Arisha traditions early, um, early in my opinion, you know. Um, yeah. So I would I would have asked way more questions, I, which would have led to most likely different godparents which most likely would have made me, I don't know, I'm going on 15 this summer. You would maybe have been I, an ancient. <laughs> maybe I would have, maybe, maybe I, I'd be, you know, pushing 30 in my, in my ultra years, you know, in okay. my, in my, if I would have gotten introduced, you know, let's say 12, 13, 14, you know. Or younger. You know, like, mom, what's going on in that room? Why, why does it smell like it's like something's burning? And why does it smell like there's a cigar being blown? And why there's three women sitting around a table? Yeah. And I think that it's interesting um, meeting people now. They're very afraid. And one of the questions is, how do I introduce my children to it? I have really young children. And I'm like, how do you introduce anything? You tell them about it. 
It sounds really rough sometimes, and I do try to sugarcoat it just a little bit, but that's what you believe in. And that's why I said, right. like, for us, this is just so normal. Like, oh, somebody's coming, whatever. Like, they're like, yeah, it happens. Um, I think that trying to shield our children for these traditions, it brings up an interesting point of view because in – so. Something that you mentioned is that everybody's like, oh, you know, that was the, the, the side, you know, the side tour that we would do to see my aunt because nobody wanted to be seen going in or leaving. It's almost like it has a negative connotation, but we still go to that person to get that reading and to get at that ebo and to get that bath. As and, well, that, it, it was simply because 95% of the family was already Pentecostal by then. Ah, uh, you know, gotcha. And... and and I'm not saying this particular phrase in any negative connotation. It's just a stereotypical It is. Phrase. No, no, no. It's not negative. This is, we're talking cultural things. Correct. Yeah. So most of my family are Bible thumpers. Mm-hmm. I have an aunt who is, I mean, she has various um, levels of um, religious education. She's a deaconess at her church. But one of my aunts, Preaches on a radio show out of radio show out of Philadelphia. Yeah, at least at least twice a week. It's like her part time job. She hits the streets to feed the homeless. She'll go on a three day spiritual retreat at the church where they are literally fasting and drinking nothing but water for three days. I have literally been woken up, and if my aunt, if this particular aunt, who's religious. If she had been raised in these traditions, she would be one hell of a spiritual worker. And I'll tell you why. Because I have slept over at my aunt's house. She has gotten phone calls five, six, seven o'clock in the morning. And I have heard her praying over someone on the phone who had a need, whether it was a medical need, someone who was in the hospital, someone else who was sick, someone who had a, a different type of situation. I have heard her speak and pray over the phone. She has woken me up with her talking in tongues. And I wake up in my entire body, all the hairs on my body are standing up. So she has a she in okay. that tongue of hers. She does. Mm-hmm. And I will and I will give everyone out there it doesn't matter what you believe. Of course, no. The the, the thing is to have faith. And I will give you a good example. After I got initiated and I was in Iyabu, well, I was maybe about two, three months into my first year. My mom called me that her baby brother had been, uh, who was already, you know, a man in his 40s, but he was the youngest sibling. Um, her baby brother had been hit by a car and got sent flying on the highway about 150 feet. Mm. He was rushed to the hospital with a traumatic brain injury and they gave him 48 hours. They actually had to uh, handcuff him to the side rails of the bed in the neuro division uh, of the hospital because he was literally fighting for his life and his arms were flailing. Oh my God. That's how, and they have to literally give him morphine to calm him down. That's how he was in his coma from the traumatic brain injury. Mm -hmm. My mom said to me, they're going to operate on Tuesday morning. She told me what time the surgery was scheduled for. Um, There's certain things that I can't say, but you know that during the first three months, we literally, we don't do much with the Orishas when we're a, a new initiate. There's, mm-hmm. it's a fresh, it's a fresh relationship. So therefore you go to your godparents, mm-hmm. Orishas, the ones that you were reborn from. Mm-hmm. So I, I told my godfather what was going on. He and I were living together at the time. He was, we were roommates. And I asked him if I could speak to his Oya, the one that birthed me. Mm-hmm. And I remember crying and I, I'm emotional now, but I remember crying and asking her to save his life. And I literally remember a couple of days later, I called my mom 
because she told me that the operation was going to be the next day. She called me Monday afternoon. Um, and what's so interesting is, even though she was she said a castle, she you know she said she knew I was initiated. Um, she came to my ceremony afterwards when everything was done, and she came to the the drumming, you know, the party that we have when when you're introducing a new initiate to society. Mm-hmm. And I remember her telling me Friday night when she called me with the original phone call. You know, I don't know what you got to do over there, but, you know, if you got to speak to your people or something That's to that hysterical. effect. She's like, you know, talk to your godfather, you know, maybe you can speak to, you know, to your people. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, and I'm like, this is hilarious. But, you know, when it's life or death, you will pull at whatever straw you have left Correct. in your hand. I agree. You know, when you're up against, you know, the wall. And I called her Monday evening. We spoke. She told me what time the operation was going to be. She said, say a prayer, light a candle, do whatever you, you know you got to do over there tomorrow in the morning. So because we don't know what the outcome of this operation is going to be. They needed to go in and um, re, uh, do a um, do create a flap on his scalp, do a craniotomy to try to relieve some of the swelling and pressure in his brain. And I remember calling her Tuesday morning around lunchtime. And I said to her, how did the operation go? And she said, they canceled it. I said, what do you mean they canceled it? Like, did he die? Like, what happened? She's like, no, your aunt came in here last night with some people from church. And she prayed over him and she um, got touched by the Holy Spirit. She was talking in tongue and she, in, in tongues, while she was, doing her thing she asked someone for some oil and she anointed his body and he woke up this morning wondering why he was in the hospital wow yeah Ashe I think comes so, but, so, to so anybody believe whatever and, you want to yeah believe whatever you want to believe whether it was me praying at home out of faith or whether it was my mother or my aunt but something happened absolutely literally something happened because so, how do you cancel how do you cancel a craniotomy and the person just wakes up? Yeah. I'm I'm saying there's a lot of things that go on in the spiritual realm. So Perfect. with that, we need to understand that the power of prayer and faith in whatever faith you have is very can, important. Um, and it can literally move mountains. Of course it can. Now if we are so now we're taking away the aspect of your aunt, the other aunt, the one in Puerto Rico. Mm-hmm. If you were to do it all over again, so let's say obviously you didn't get to do that, what would you have changed in your journey then? I probably would have started when I got my warriors in 97, I probably would have started looking for godparents then. Okay. Well, you did find godparents, obviously. Correct. Uh, I found godparents. Correct. I found them several years later in 2003, 2004. And it took me a while to, um, gain the knowledge and the faith to make the last change or the, or the, or the, take, I guess, take the plunge as they say. Um, and I finally, uh, did Ocha in 2007. I remember. If I could do it again, I would have done it sooner. Okay. Um, what else? So, what else would you have either changed or left the same? If you were to do it all over again. I would probably change godparents for someone who was older in the traditions. Oh, okay. Yeah, some are more experienced, some are more knowledgeable. Okay. Why is it that that became into play like why why is that one of your reasons well my old Bona, which is the second godparent mm-hmm. um just like with a couple having a child mm-hmm. you know it, you, it takes two um my old Bona is um 
I believe, pushing 25 and Ocha. My godfather was, I met him when he was barely three weeks out of his, the beginning of his initiation. I remember. So I, 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 remember I, traveled, I traveled that journey with him during his first year. And, you know, it began as a wonderful friendship. And the reason why I would change him is because I don't think he was ready. Mm. Even though he initiated me when he was about three and a half, no, four and a half going on five, I don't think he was prepared enough because our relationship, after like my second year being initiated, my relationship just with him started to go downhill a little bit and yeah. he had a totalitarianism type of mentality. Yes. He he was more of a control person and even one of my god brothers and he got into a conversation one time where um my god brother told him, Well, you know, not for nothing but I came here voluntarily, and now it seems like you're running a dictatorship. Oh, my God. Okay. Do you remember the question that I asked you right before you made Ocha when you told me you were going to do it? Yes. You asked me if I was sure if I I wanted that person to. It wasn't about you making Ocha. I was always sure you were going to do that. That was. Right. Uh, if I if I if you if I was sure about the people who were going to be doing ultra to me, I didn't know about the controlling issues until later. Correct. When you and I spoke much much later, because honestly, because so the, this is a conversation that we are candidly having for all of you listeners of what we don't talk about when we're making these decisions. So right. the, this this conversation that that Pedro. Omoya is having with us is not something that you will normally have, which I think if you would have had earlier, more candidly, I think you would have made a better choice. And that's why we're having these conversations so that when it's your turn, you don't walk through that. And He's sitting nice and chill right now and wait till the funny side comes out, if it does, because he's being very serious, but he's very, very funny. And um, it's almost like I saw the light of him, like it was like there, but there was something that was not quite right. And when you're choosing someone, it's okay. Let me, let me kind of put it in a, in a certain way. It's like, you can almost see that finish line right there. And if you go with this person, the finish line, you can touch it. You can taste it. It's yours. Oh, you can totally have it. But there's something about that person who is going to take you to that crossing line that you're not quite so sure about at the moment. And there's those moments of, uh, I don't know, but you ignore it because the finish line is right there. Correct. Your Ocha was right. It was like, right there. you're like, you're almost there. And it's like, I remember, I remember I used to live at 113th Street at that point. And I remember like, um, uh, oh, no, maybe, maybe not. No, no, no. I think I had moved into the other apartment in 107. And I just remember, I remember almost looking into space like, I'm not sure about this for him. It's not that you need what in my father used to call rienda suelta for you to do whatever the hell you want. That's not it. But there were just some things here and there that were amiss. And here's another thing that I remember it spiking on me is that the relationship, when it's too best friendy, it will change. And I don't care what anybody says. It's going to change. And it doesn't always change for the better. Correct. Almost everybody that I know 
who has made Ocha with someone they considered their friend, almost every single relationship has been fractured. And if they are still godparent and godchild, that relationship is severed from friendship. And I think that that also played a tone in your relationship with him, I remember. Correct. And I'll expand on that just a little bit just to give uh, our listeners a little bit of insight. We were best friends. We would go everywhere. We would um, go to parties, hang out, go to clubs together. Um, We ended up moving in together. He's got one bedroom. I've got the other one. We we, we were literally living a Laverne and Shirley type of life. You know, two best friends. The minute that he put beads on me, the minute that we started making moves towards Ocha, now he is my religious godparent. Yeah. Now he has a say. Authority. He has a certain authority mm-hmm. in what I, you can and cannot do. Mm-hmm. That's where the relationship changed. Once pay attention, I, what, people, it, to this. I like pay what attention. It, what it, what it, <laughs> Well, it started changing. It started changing. And those were some of the signs that you picked up on. Yes. You know, because I remember you asking me one time, you know, I know he's the best friend and everything, but are you sure you want that for yourself? And I could not see. I think you were trying to be. I was trying to be diplomatic and I didn't want to burst your bubble because one, I absolutely wanted you to, to do this. But I just wasn't sure, and I could almost see it, but I didn't know what the it was, if that makes any sense to anybody. Correct. Correct. And um, once I did do Ocha, then it totally changed because now, excuse me, I thought I was going to sneeze, and I ended up yawning. It's okay. Um, It's okay. (laughs) for, For a period of a year and seven days, He has total, the godparent has total authority because you have to abide by many rules and regulations. You know, you can't go out at certain times of the day. You should be home when the sun is setting or before the sun is setting. You can't go out if it's raining without a a covering on your head. You can't go on by noon. You can't let the sun hit you. You, I mean, there's a lot of rules. We're talking about, um, uh, Lukumi. The Correct. rules are different for Isheshe. And I'm not sure exactly on the rules for Candombles and Voodoo, but I only speak on the ones that I know. So I get it. So, you know, there, there's a whole set of guidelines that you have to follow. And then there's the, but I'm your godfather. And unfortunately, um, I'm like eight years older than him in life. I've already been married, been divorced, owned a house, sold a house, owned at least two, three cars. What do you know about life? <laughs> That's why I think you said you would have liked somebody older and more prepared. I think now that we're talking about this candidly, I think that it's important also when you're looking for someone to find someone who respects your age here on earth. All right. And what you've been through. So if I would have initiated when I was 21, I'm a little nothing at this point. I'm, I'm not even a little shoot that's getting up. Mold me. I'm yours. But if I am, you know, much older and I've been through life, there has to be a certain respect that is already given to you. And it should. And I think that when we're starting in these traditions, we're so rushing to get that godparent that we will bypass certain things that in another situation we would not bypass. And I think Correct. that's what happens here. Correct. Yeah. So. And but of course it, it turns into, you know, well, you know, you, you can't do this, you know, you can't do that, you know, you can't do this. And, you know, you say something and I, I said this one night, um, he's like, what are you doing? And I said, I know the rule. Um, and I won't get into what the details are mm-hmm. for, for, 
for the sake of the podcast. Um, but I just wanted to be done with it. I mean, technically, it was after midnight. I got up to go to the bathroom, and I said, oh, let me just take this off. He heard me flushing the toilet. He's like, what are you doing? You know, where's your head covering? I said, oh, I took it off. He's like, why? I said, I know the rule. And I just went back to bed. That there was a little show of defiance. So let me, let me kind of, so I'm actually looking around and I'm picturing the whole thing. And I think something else that needs to be said, and also it's, a, it's very important because you didn't say this, but again, I'm, I'm starting to backtrack to people that I have met over the years. You should never live with your godparent. I don't care. Don't do it. Very, maybe very stay true. over, maybe for a weekend, maybe right. for like. If, if, if for ceremonies. Or sh- and oh, yeah, definitely ceremonies. We're not talking about that. We're talking like a living situation. Maybe if you, you, I don't know, transitioning like no more than a month. I'm not kidding. Don't do it. Every, and I mean every single situation of every single priest. We're talking initiated people. We're not talking brand new people. That is a different type of relationship. But even so, never, ever live with your godparent. And I think that this tradition is more than a religion and it's free will. But when somebody who has authority over you now lives with you, the dynamics are about to change big time. You didn't say that one, but I'm looking at the pattern and I think you're right. And I mean, the way that it it looks like to me, based on your story, based on what I know from knowing you, Pedro, is that the friendship line got blurred, started getting blurred. Correct. Until the point that there was no more friendship because now I am your elder. Shut the hell up and do what I say. And when you're coming in from a friendship point of view, that's not good. Right. Who's my friend to talk to me like that? Yes. So when you're choosing, I think it is best, even if you like this person, to understand the responsibility of a godparent. They're never your friend. I'm sorry. And now I'm, I'm really, I'm saying this from my heart. Your godparent is never going to be your best friend. That's not their job. Correct. That's not a person you should go clubbing with. You, you, you should hang out. That Because all of this, when it's time for the rules to be abided, it's going to come out and bite you. And you're not going to like it. And it's not going to feel good. And then who's wrong? So is Pedro wrong for taking off his cap? Or is the godparent wrong for admonishing at the rules so now is which one you're in your home for just a moment you just needed to whatever it is you know it's just an example but these are things that we want you to think about because in the beginning just like when you're dating there's a honeymoon stage there's a honeymoon stage between godparents and future potential godchildren and everything is going to be beautiful But you don't get to see that side when now you are my godchild. You are my responsibility. You listen to me. Correct. And that is a very different dynamics. I think that that's what happened, but I couldn't couldn't pinpoint it at that time, Pedro. And when I finally, you know, walked away and, you know, went about my own life, I also walked away from my Ojubona. And for two years, no one knew about me. Because my godfather and my Jubona were still um, close close in working the traditions together. It wasn't up until he did something to my old Jubona that then their relationship got fractured. And my old Jubona didn't see it coming because my godfather had a fractured relationship with his godfather due to lack of respect. I think the point that you I'm seeing from what you're saying 
and correct me if I'm wrong. So listening to all of this, I think the point that I'm hearing you, if you could do anything differently, would have been to take off your rose-colored glasses with that future oh. person that you were planning on. Oh. I mean, do I get that right? Correct. So, okay, so we have that. So we have two major things that, if done differently, would have completely altered your entire journey. All right. Just those two. And I almost, I'm so sad that you're not here presently because I would jump out and hug you and almost cry because I remember some of the things that you went through and you, the listeners, do not know this man, what I said when I introduced him, he is so resilient. Rubber ain't got nothing on him. <laughs> he bounces back. For real. And um, it's not that he ever called me crying, but I could hear the pain as he was going through what he was going through. And I was not an initiate at that time. I didn't know how to help him. I felt very helpless. So the resiliency that you have is honorable. It is amazing. And at the same token, I wonder how much less stressful your life would have been if, especially the latter, because when you're little, you're going to listen to your parents because they'll smack you like, no, we're not going in the room. Fuck at that. You know, <laughs> but if you would have chosen differently, maybe you would have had a much, much, much different experience. And you wouldn't have gone through a lot of what you went through. And people don't understand you do need a godparent, but you got to choose wisely. It is the one choice you have. Make it count. Correct. It's a lifetime. If, you, if, you, if you plan on following this tradition, I've heard People say, and I truly believe this myself, it took me a while because I was younger when I heard it. Mm -hmm. This isn't just a tradition. It's a way of life. Yeah. I've heard that. My Yeah, I've heard a lot of people say that. That's why, remember when I said this isn't just a religion, this is a tradition because this is how we do things. Yeah. And if you're going to follow these traditions as a way of life, you also want that to bring you quality of life to yeah, your way awesome. of life. That's awesome. Absolutely. To your way of life. We're all going to have stumbling blocks in life. That's just life throwing you curveballs. And that's going to happen. No, that's, every, that's everything. It doesn't matter what religion. But, Everybody gets it. But, but no one should feel like a... Prisoner? No, like a pinball machine. Oh. Where you're being bounced around or where you feel like life is constantly you constantly hitting you with yeah. with, you know, all these different curveballs. Most of us come into this looking for something different. That something different should be to improve your quality of life. Thank you, you for know, that and I agree. Forget about, you know, oh, I want to get pregnant. Forget about, oh, I, you know, I want to get married. Oh, I want to find the love of my life. Forget all of that. There's no price that you can put on peace in your home and quality of life. Everything else will fall into place. Thank you for that. And I know that I definitely needed to hear that. At this exact moment. <laughs> and I think this goes into your religious life. And in the beginning, the best advice that I can give anybody is to slow down a bit. Because if you slow down, maybe you can ask and pray Obatala to take those glasses, those rose colored glasses off so that you could see clearly. I mean, that is the Orisha of having a cool head. That means that for you to think clearly, you will make better decisions. And I All think right. what you just said, it hits home in more ways that I can begin to say in this podcast. But if something is not bringing you peace and quality of life, 
it's just not worth it. It's just so not worth it. It doesn't matter what. It could be this religion. It could be the next Buddhism, whatever religion you choose. It could be whatever. It's just not worth it. And I think we should always strive to find that quality of life and peace to say, to look around at a moment and say, you know, there's nothing wrong with this moment. This moment is awesome. Thank you, Arisha. Like, or, thank you, this. Exactly. Every day I wake up and I am blessed. Not because I'm alive. Every day that we wake up and we're alive, we're blessed. But I've had numerous blessings just through faith and prayer and following my path. Mm-hmm. I've, I've been blessed where, I mean, to put it bluntly, I have doubled my income in the last, in the last five years. Ah, that is wonderful. And I, yes, that's wonderful. And I remember when you were going for a certain position. I remember we were talking, and when you got it, it was like I don't know how you were able to tell that to me so calm and coolly and collect that I would have been screaming and skipping like a little girl. I, uh, you know why? Because. It, it needed to happen when it needed to happen. Gotcha. See, I wanted that promotion. I wanted that promotion simply to get out of the position that I was in. Gotcha. I was looking for the next best thing. But someone else got it, and that person was literally... It literally took them nine months to go through the hiring process, select someone, to them let them go on day 89. Mm. Bueno, you know, in Spanish, and you're Puerto Rican, so you, you're going to know this saying, lo que es para ti es para ti. What's for you right. is for you. What, what's yours is yours, yeah, yeah exactly. What's for you is for um, you. What's yours is yours. So I get that. And and what's so interesting is when I finally got it, I didn't scream. I didn't. I just cried. I just cried because when I found out about it, I made a couple of phone calls and I was just told to reapply. And I followed through by asking the grapevine a couple of questions like, well, why should I reapply if I didn't get it the first time around? Yeah, because jobs have a process. You know, um, and then come to find out when I got a second interview, they're like, you know, we we held you in high regard. We we had you at almost at the top of the list. It was just you and this other candidate, but that other candidate did something that you didn't do. And I said, what was that? And they said, you didn't send us a thank you note, a thank you letter for the first interview. And I said, would you like to know something? I've interviewed for other positions, and that is totally my modus operandi. Yeah, you know why like I, to me, I've never... I've I, always said, I, I, I literally said to them, the only reason why I didn't is because I know both of you. I didn't want to seem like that young kid that was brown-nosing. But still. And I, and I said to myself, I'm going to leave this up to destiny. I'm not going to purposely send a thank you note because I don't want them to think I'm brown. If it's meant for me, it's meant for me. And I didn't get it the first time. I got it nine months later. Gotcha. So this is what which I have. Is, oh, sorry. No, go ahead. Finish out your thought. Go I was going to say, which is precisely Oya's number. Oh, that's right. Look at that. I didn't even pick that up. That's right. So I have three things. So three things that I have. Two things you would have changed. One, you're going to keep the same. So the first thing is you would have asked questions much younger of age. Second, you would have chosen wiser, wise, wiser, wiser choice for your godparent. But third, one thing you would do could still the same is to live a life of gratitude. Correct. That's amazing. And it sounds, and I know we kind of went into it with all the stories and all the stuff, but. I live every day in gratitude. And 
I'm glad you shared that because when we're going through difficult times or when we are in uncertain times, and what I mean uncertain is, when am I going to go initiate? When am I going to find a godparent? And I've been here for three months and I've been here for a year and I haven't seen anybody and I haven't gotten a reading. When you're there, you're not living in a space of gratitude and it can actually hinder you and slow you down in that process. And I don't know, like energetically how it works and frankly I really don't care I just know that gratitude works so before we wrap up the podcast is there anything else quickly that you would like to share of anything that you were would do differently or the same if you were to do this all over again and this meaning the Orisha traditions I would actually tell people have the conversations early. What kind of conversations? Not necessarily about expectations or what you expect or what you hope to achieve with a potential godparent. Direct, blunt conversations in respectful tones and respectful manners. This is how I am. This is how I expect to be treated. This is what I am looking for. Lay the cards out on the table so that if it isn't a fit, at least you know early on. I because if you can't those if you can't believe those conversations, if you can't have those conversations early on and say, Well, you know what? This might work for me, but this might not work for me, at least you know that you went in. being totally honest and what you expect because at the very minimum and this is very big for me it took me years to understand because when you're young and capricious and you know you want things your way you know it's one thing but once you're older and you actually learn the true meaning of what it is to respect not just someone who's older than you in life, but respect your elder in the religion. It brings such a meaningful purpose. And I will give our listeners an example. My old Jubona, which is my second godparent, he and I have a beautiful relationship. I don't bother him for anything. When I say I don't bother him for anything, I don't even call him to tell him, hey, how you doing? We text each other. A, he's a busy person. B, I'm a busy person. Um, but the one thing I have for him is the utmost respect and admiration. He is a child of Obatala, and he truly is a polite, gentle person until you cross that line. <laughs> and his course. nickname, his nickname is Iceman. For his 15th Ocha birthday over 10 years ago, we literally, a group of us got together and we had a shirt designed for him with, um, a picture of Obatala, his um, Ocha name, um, a crown done in sequins, and on the back it says Iceman. I love it. I love it. Because he is so nice and kind until you cross that line. And when you cross that line, that's it. You're done. Gotcha. He, unfortunately, unfortunately, he... As a human trait, I would say that is his downfall. As a as a human, his fault would be is that sometimes he can have very little patience. When you but when you do something over and over and over, he'll give you a second chance. You may even get a third, but by then you're done. Well, by I- then. It's- I'm and sorry. that, and, and one of and one of the reasons why I respect him so much is because of what I went through. And he and I had a candid conversation, and we had a kind of conversation when I came back into the picture after his relationship with my godfather became pra- fractured because he was an adopted because my godfather was an adopted godchild. There was really no religious ties one to the other 
other than the fact that they had crowned godchildren together. Um, but there was no reason why my older boy and I could not say to him, you know what, this isn't working out. You go your way, I go mine. Mm -hmm. So because there were no real big ties, my older boy and I was able to do that. Once I came back into the picture and we had a conversation one day after a ceremony, there were other priests and priestesses there. And then literally it became like a Me Too movement. This was like in 2011, about the time that the Me Too stuff started coming back, I mean, coming out. Oh, that's funny. And so now this is the Ocha Me Too movement. <laughs> this was the Ocha Me Too movement. You know, I started speaking out and I started saying, well, you know, he did this, he did this, he said this, he said that. You know, my old one was like, oh, my God, how come you never told me? Like, Because I, you don't. And I can totally, I can understand why you don't. Fear, you don't say fear, anything. You're scared. Fear of, back, fear of backlash. Absolutely. Exactly. I get it. I get okay. it. Okay. Then godchildren that my godfather, my, I'm sorry, that my old one I had crowned. Well, he did this to me and he did that to me. And he said that to me. And he was like, what? Now, wait a minute. I'm your godfather. How come you didn't tell me that? Because you fear. And this is okay. So for and then all of three you other listeners. People, oh, go ahead. And then, and then three other people came out and, and said and added to the situation as well. Well, yeah, because and, fear and, and, and the relationship I, of the godparent is, is one that is unique. This is a person that you're supposed to respect. This is a person you're not supposed to question. This is a person who's supposed to know what to do in that position of authority of a, over another person. Correct. It's scary as like AF, like really. And, and, and at least five people came out including myself and we you know we when these things were finally said it was like oh my god I wish I had known I mean they went on trips together to you know initiate other people I bet, yeah. in, in Cuba and in Mexico they've traveled to they have traveled to California and to Chicago to initiate other people you know had he known this he himself would have severed the relationship but that's the thing. There there are a lot of things within the Orisha traditions that are not openly spoken about. And that is what happens to you as a person when you decide that this person is going to be your godparent. What can they, have they done to people when they're great and when they're not? What is it that you need to look out for in order for the not to not happen to you. Correct. And the thing is, there are many places that you cannot. It is seen as though you smack them in the face in public in the middle of church if you Correct. speak openly. And we're talking serious things. We're talking theft, rape. We're talking major. And even though it is even wrong in, 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 in a court of law and the religion is, that's okay. We're going to take it to the Arisha and we're going to put it under the rug. You don't speak about your godparent that way. You got to respect your godparent. And then the torture, and let's just call it what it is. It's abusive behavior. It continues. Correct. And when we're, we're not doing this podcast to scare anyone because there is many things that, you know, first of all, he still has a crown on his head. He like, oh, you know, Pedro, you're still an amazing human being. All of these things shaped you to the human that you are today. However, right. would it have been a little less painful if some of these things wouldn't have happened? Heck yeah. Of course. Of course. So that's what we're trying to do so that you do not go through this stuff. So this is what I have so far. Ask more questions. If you're young and you're in a position to do it, ask your questions. Choose your right. godparent wisely. Sorry, I'm reading my notes. Wisely. Okay. Have gratitude because not everything is falling apart every single second of the day. And even if you have the capacity to get online and to learn more about Arishas, Pedro, that was not happening in our day. We did not have that. <laughs> there was no internet for us to kind of go into and really look. 
So be grateful that you have what you have. And lastly, have those hard conversations. So shameless plug in Alejos 101. Remember when we talked about it and we finally got, you know, Alejos 101 came up in it. There is a question that the like questionnaire that we give to all of our students on how to start that conversation. Cause it's not an easy topic because you almost feel the only way that I can put it, correct me if I'm wrong. Let's say, you and I are dating and we're considering marriage. I'm like, if I ask this hard question, he's going to leave me. Like, it almost feels like that. <laughs> like, I don't want to have, I don't want to, I don't want to like tip the boat over. I don't want to mess up. I don't want him not to think that I'm not worthy of being a God child. And that is further from the truth. What you said. Correct. Perfect. I would use the word vet and interview. When you are interviewing candidates and you are vetting someone for a position in your, whether it's in your life or at work or a significant other, you have to consider anything and everything that can happen. I like that. So there, so therefore by vetting and by interviewing prospective godparents, you can get a better picture and ask their elders. Do not be afraid to ask their elders, hey, may I ask you a question? How is this person with regards to, you know, ABC, one, two, three? And do it in a, don't do it behind their back. No. Do it, obviously, hey, you know what? Can I can I speak with your elders? Can I speak with your peers? And that's the, the thing. So the, here, what you said was really important because I know of a particular situation right now where there are no elders available and they can do whatever they want. That's always a red flag. If that's somebody that you cannot vet them with someone, yeah, that's a red flag. There has to be someone who knows them well that you can. Um, some people do not have godparents anymore. The godparent may have died, right? The godparent may have moved away or they have drifted away. That's okay. But there should be godbrothers. There should be God sisters. There should be another type of elder that they go to. If they do not have an elder above them, that is probably a problem or somebody that they don't that they work with. Correct. And if you do not see that's that, a major red flag. that's a because major red flag because you could get yourself stuck into almost a cultish situation. Unless you are 30, 40 years and older. Well, yeah, and, and you're older. You are the elder. But still, everyone, if everyone else is running, everyone at the, the end of the day, at the end of the day, there's someone that is older than everybody else. Correct. That and that's what needs to happen. And I and everyone else still needs to be accountable to uh, someone else. Be accountable and, and still follow guidance. And I will I will circle around for one thing. When my grand when my godfather and my older boy's relationship became fractured. I don't know what the circumstances were because I wasn't there. Mm -hmm. What I do know was that my Odubona's godmother, until she passed several years ago, mm -hmm. when she was still around, she looked at my at my Odubona and she said, Richard, that's it. He's done. I want him out. You put his stuff on the front porch. Let him come get it. Don't open the door. And he said the Spanish word for godmother is madrina. And Richard says, but Madrina, she said, that's it, hable, I have spoken. And she gave him that motherly look, like, hey, don't forget who the elder is about here. Yeah. And he had to take a back seat. And, I, he said, and, and yeah, I, people don't understand the someone, eldership and how that works. Oops, sorry, go ahead. No, I was going to say, at the end of the day, everyone is accountable to someone else. But here's the situation. And like I said, I know of a particular situation where there's no accountability for the head. If that is a problem, just yeah. believe me when I tell you that can be a very big red flag. If there's no one that somebody is accountable to, I would run. Correct. I would run. So every time that we have a guest... In our podcast, I'm going to put my notebook away because this is like the fun part. There's a question that we ask all of our guests. 
And the question is, if there was a vision on how the world would be, what would that look like for you? It's something so basic. Go ahead. Um, I wish everyone would have the inner peace and tranquility that they deserve. Just, I've seen the world change. I'm only I'm only 48 years old, but I'm an old soul, and I've seen the world change so much in my years here on Earth that. It's a shame. I know that in most religions believe in some sort of reincarnation. But it's a shame that every day I have to pray for world peace and my own elevation because I truly do not want to come back. Wow. The world is sad that we're living in. There's so much going on. There has been a deterioration of humanity itself. I literally pray every day for my own proper uplifting because I do not want to come back. I want to make it to that white light and, and not come back. Run, run. Don't go into the light. <laughs> this is going to be, don't go into the but, light. But, but, but seriously, I wish everyone would just have, find something that brings you peace and stick to that. That's amazing. And, and then work on your quality of life because once you have those two things, you set everything. Everything else will seem like pinball, and you're the flippers inside that pinball machine, just going pachoom, 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 yeah. pachoom, just you know, literally flipping them out of your way. Yeah, yeah. You know, I'm I'm here in one of my best friend's house in his apartment. He just moved this weekend, and um, he's made certain changes recently. You know, and through divine intervention and everything that is kind in the universe, he was able to leave where he was living, get a better job. He just recently moved into his own apartment this weekend. But if it's, it's one of the things that he can tell you if he were able to speak, it's that in the 20 years that he and I have also known each other, He's been through many things. I've been through many things. But the one thing that we can both agree on is that inner peace and that quality of life and just let everything else fall apart around you. As long as you have those two things, there's no, nothing better. Thank you for that. And I think that it is a great, is a great vision that I, I don't, think it will ever happen fully but you know what that's energy that we're putting out into the universe if we can start Correct. with ourselves so Correct. where can folks find you online if they want to further this conversation if they want to chit chat if they want to tell you i loved you on the podcast i want to chat with you <laughs> where can they, they find they you Excuse me, I'm, I have to yawn again. Um, they can find me in uh, on Facebook. Uh, my Facebook name is Rican and Heat. R I C A N H E A T. I'm sorry, it's Rican Heat. Um, wait, wait, wait! I don't think it's with a C. Oh, that's right. It's Rican Heat with a K. R I K A N H E A T. And there are two words. And there are two words. And stop correct. yawning. I may have to come over there. I know where you live. <laughs> <laughs> I know where you live. Yeah, but I'm actually three buildings over at my best friend's house. Whatever. So I'll, be, find you. Be I'll find you. I'll find you. I'll Google map you. <laughs> you'll, you'll, be, you'll be knocking on my door for nothing. Oh. Um, um, or, they can, or they can find me through the um, through the web group. Oh, that means the Orisha uh, Wisdom Community? The, through the Orisha, Orisha Okay, so Wisdom. in Facebook, we have a community. It's called Orisha Wisdom Community. And yeah, he's there. And you can definitely find him there. if Because I know that we all have like private um, profiles. But that's a place that you can always tag someone and, and he'll see it. So Correct. yeah, I just had to check on your name for a second. I'm like, wait a second. I don't think that's right. But we're all good. 
So, all right. Remember, you can find him on his handle, which is Recon Heat. And I, first of all, want to thank you. When I asked you to do this, we've been trying to get you on the podcast forever and trying to pick the best topic ever. But then this topic came about and I said, oh, my God, he would be like perfect for this. And I wanted to thank you. For, thank you. No, no, no. Thank you. We could do this all day. Long. Thank you because you <laughs> took your time. You shared things that I didn't even know about you. And all the years we've known each other, I didn't know a lot about these things. And because you were candid. Camp, I, you're amazing, like always. Um, but your, your, your candidness, your candor, that's correct, your candor, I hope that other people can see that it's just more than, I wonder what Arisha I am. Or when am I going to get initiated? Correct. I hope that your story can really shed light on what this journey could look like for them. And I just cannot thank you enough. Like, I mean it. Cannot thank you enough for your time and your words of wisdom. And I wrote some of your stuff because it's like, this is good. Good stuff. Good stuff. <laughs> Before, so. before we close, um, you had mentioned something to me that if I wanted to speak about it, and I, we totally forgot about it. Cause oh, my God, because the conversation got so good. <laughs> because the conversation got so good, exactly. Um, for those of us out there in the LGBT community, if you are ever wondering, is this for me? Um, how will I fit in? How will this work for me? While you are seeking elders and godparents to represent you before you take any deep dives. These are conversations you need to have from the door. Not every, um, we call them ILE, I-L-E. Or not houses. Every, or houses. Mm -hmm. uh, not every house is LGBT welcoming, even though most are, are pretty much free range these days, but you do have a couple of old school elders out there who are still a little um, apprehensive would be a good word. And that's actually also, a really conservative way of putting it. Let me be very real with everybody. Some of them, if you're gay or anything like it, they're not going to take you, period. Period. So um, I know he was trying to be a little tender about because, it, but... Because there are, there are certain traditions that commingle, such as Palo Mayombe and um, the Lukumi tradition. Some of those Houses practice both our uh, traditions and the old school elders made it so that the LGBT community isn't always welcomed. Mm -hmm. So you still have people out there and it's not a prejudice thing. It's just and a lot of people will say this. That's how my elders did it. That's how I do it. Correct. You know, sometimes it's a frame of mind versus actually using your thought process. I've actually heard this one. Um, it's part of my tradition. That is how my line does it. Okay. I um, don't agree with that. But I don't agree with it either. So I'm those saying that's the excuse that has been given. Correct. I was fortunate enough that my godfather and my Ojibwana are both LGBT. QIA, um, I think those are the extra at, uh, initials that were added. We keep adding um, more, but it's all right, all good. <laughs> well, because it all depends whether you're questioning, whether you're transgendered, whether you're actually yeah, uh, intersex, and I forget what the A stands for. Um, but regardless of that, that your future godparents will ask these questions, have these conversations before you make that lifelong commitment. Because like we said, it is a relationship. It should be mutually respectful, mutually loving, um, mutually giving. It should not be a one way I give you take type of relationship. But most importantly, they should have your interests at heart. If your interests are not in their heart or they cannot Accept. Put your best, or cannot accept um, who you are, or they cannot put your best interests first and take them into consideration. It's probably not the person for you to 
in the long run, make a lifelong commitment. You know, Pedro, I was actually thinking, I don't think that this is a topic that we can just do to end. I openly asking you to come back and talk about that because I don't think that that's something that just a couple of sentences will do. And we've already kind of done the podcast for this episode, but I would love to speak with you further about it in another conversation because there are a lot of people who are questioning. They are thinking that their sexuality is affecting other houses. We'll tell them, well, you're not accepted here. It's just the way we do things. But I like you. And I think we need to have a further conversation. So I'm crossing my fingers that you'll say yes. Because okay. I, love it. I, love it. I love it. I love it. I love you so much. So I thank you for that. Because, yeah, we did have this side note, but then the conversation got so good. So thank you for keeping it short. And I really like thank you so, so much for everything that you have shared with us today. Um, thank you for the invitation. And I look forward to our next one in the future. Yes. You have reached the end of this episode. For show notes, go to orishawisdom.com forward slash 8585. Now, this episode was brought to you by the Alejos Guide to Godparents. So remember, go to orishawisdom.com forward slash omileti, and that's O-M-I-L-E-T-I. Check out, especially after this discussion, I would think that if you're not driving, you're definitely going to that website to go check it out. Remember that Orisha swag is around. Get your t-shirts, your mugs for Orisha art, and which is made by an Orisha worshiper for Orisha worshipers of the world. And I still think that one of my currently favorite ones is, hold on, let me call my babalao, because that's how we seem to approach everything. Hold on, let me call my santero. I love it. And you can get them by going to orishawisdom.com forward slash omileti because that's basically the information links place and go and get them before everything is gone. Have you found value in what we do here at the Orisha Wisdom Podcast and the content that I create? Check out my Patreon page at patreon.com forward slash omileti. Oh, wait, no, Iya omileti. Unfortunately, I'm not an Iya, as you all know, but it has to stay there because I can't change it. So it's patreon.com forward slash Iya omileti. And you will have access to the podcasts before they are published. You also get perks such as exclusive content which is not heard anywhere not even my email community has access to that content and I, you know how much I love my email folks plus you will get kudos here on the podcast for the world to hear and only if you are able to and if you want to come and support the Orisha Wisdom podcast through Patreon can't wait to see you there thank you in advance for your support now if you really also love this episode and you loved and you found it valuable for your growth or your friend, the best thing for you to do is to share it. Share this podcast episode so that someone else can get something out of it, especially this episode when we're talking about what to do if we had to start over. The four points that were there were just amazing. And I think that if I would have applied that stuff, I would have been in so like a different place space all together. And another way to show your gratitude would be to go over to iTunes, leave our podcast a review. I read each and every one of them and they give us the fuel to keep going and to keep creating more content for your spiritual journeys. And those couple of minutes is just a couple of minutes to you, but to me, they are the world. And of course, Every episode will go into YouTube. If you are listening to us through YouTube, what can you do? Like the episode. Comment on the episode. Of course, subscribe and click on that little bell icon so that you will be the first to know when there is a new video uploaded. Stay tuned for the next couple of episodes where we are going to do more dives into Ask a priest. This is where you get to ask questions and we will do our very, very best to answer them. Cannot wait. 
Until next time, may the elevated ancestors and all Orisha bless you immensely. Odabo! Thank you for listening to the Orisha Wisdom Podcast. Be sure to check out the show notes at orishawisdom.com forward slash podcast. Can't get enough of Orisha Wisdom? Check us out at orishawisdom.com and subscribe to our community. Remember, the wisdom of Orisha and Ifa is all around us. Be blessed and until next time. <laughs>